Great. So, evening everybody and thank you ever so much for coming. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Sarah Hall and I'm the CIPR's President-Elect and, and take up the role as President in January next year. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to chair um, this evening's media debates. I actually studied media and French at Leeds University, so this is a kind of topic that's very close to home. And obviously as a practitioner and an agency boss in, from the North East, I see a day in, day out the impact of a lack of investment in regional media. So very keen to find out um, what the solutions are to the, to the issues faced. Um, the future of the local media is, of course, a question hanging on everyone's lips right now, not just mine. And it's got wide-ranging implications for journalists, PR people, and most of all, society. And so that's why we've convened tonight a stellar panel of media experts who are here tonight to discuss the topic. And um, I'm going to welcome them on now. So we've got, here on the left, we've got Charlie Beckett. And you may know Charlie. He's a former journalist, and he's now a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics. Um, Charlie is the founding director of the LSE's journalism think tank, Polis and of its media policy project. He's also leading the LSE's Truth, Trust and Technology Commission, which launched this autumn. And I can say that's not that easy to say. Um, on my left also is Laura McInerney, who's the editor of Schools Week. And she's a columnist also for The Guardian. Um, and prior to that, Laura was a teacher and an author of the book, The Six Predictable, Predictable Failures of Free Schools and How to Avoid Them. What I love most about her bio is it says, she became a journalist after being taken to court by the Education Secretary, Michael Gove, for asking questions under the Freedom of Information Act. So that's, well, that's a pretty good going, if you ask me. Yeah, exactly. Matt was going to join us, just joining us now is, is Matt Roger MP. And I'll tell you who Matt is. He's a former journalist, a civil servant, and a current Labour Party politician. He's also the current Member of Parliament for Reading East Parliamentary constituency, get my words in. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but absolutely not least, we've got Grant Feller to my right here, who is a con content consultant, media trainer and brand strategist, and has written for uh, Daily Mail, Evening Standard, Daily Telegraph and the Daily Express, among many other titles. Um, so huge thanks to all of you for coming along tonight. A um, little bit of housekeeping for everybody present. Um, the event is being broadcast on Facebook Live, so please be aware of this if you intend to ask any questions afterwards. Um, because we do have a wider audience and this will be obviously left for the people to view afterwards. We're not working to Chatham House rule tonight. Um, the plan is for me to kick off with some questions and then after about 25 minutes we'll open up the room and, twi and to go to questions on Twitter for a more general Q&A. So you will have an opportunity to, to ask the panel any, any burning questions that you've got. We plan to wrap up the event at eight o'clock, and I do need to say that if there is a fire alarm, we don't have one planned, so, so please do exit the building uh, via the double doors you came in on, and we convene opposite, uh, you know, just across the road. So if you're tweeting tonight, the hashtag is hashtag CIPR debate, and please do get involved. So we'll, we'll get started. Um, so the idea from the event came from uh, the terrible Grenfell Tower um, tragedy. And the article that kick-started uh, kick the idea for uh, the debate was actually one of, uh, one of Grant's. Um, Grant was quoted in the Press Gazette as saying that local press in the pre-internet era would have picked up on the fire safety concerns. Um, so I want to open with that. And I'm going to go to you first, Grant. Could this terrible tragedy have been prevented? Uh, without doubt. I, I'm certain of it. And that's, what I, that's why I wrote my piece in the, in the day or two uh, immediately after the event. Um, because the morning after the fire, I, was, I had memories flooded back of my first job. My first job was on the Kensington News, and I spent an awful lot of time with the residents up around Grenfell, around that area, um, and there were three journalists on the, on the desk, <coughs> then it became two, but we were, we were there all of the time. And we were taking phone calls, and we, were, we, had, we had great contacts with the local politicians, but, but more importantly, we spent an awful lot of time plowing through council agendas. And the council agenda, well, what was interesting was that the information was there. The information was there both in the council agenda and it was there in the website that the Grenfell Tower residents had started and they were cons increasingly concerned. So there is absolutely no way that any journalist worth their salt would have missed that story. And so that's the thing that I, I, I most thought about is that with a good local paper, this would never have happened. And I wrote this article 
Interestingly, no one was interested in it at the time. Over the next 40 hours, I, I tried to place it in several papers, in Guardian and magazines as well, including the New Statesman, and no one was interested. But I knew that actually what was going to happen is eventually we were going to get to a discussion about local news. And local newspapers and journalists being the glue that holds these communities together. And that we are, <coughs> we are in a situation now where residents don't have anyone to go to except maybe their local politicians, except perhaps a local school or their doctors. Or, but the journalist used to be there and was the one that was, he or she was helping them to solve problems. And we don't have that anymore. Mike, well, what's your opinion? What's your view? Do you think that the local people have a, have a voice, have someone to turn to? Um, yes, thank you. I, I think they do. I mean, I'm probably of a similar generation to yourself, so my first job after graduating was as a trainee uh, reporter on the Woking and Times in Berkshire. And I then uh, progressed in journalism and eventually worked on the Times Educational Supplement before becoming a civil servant in the DfB. Um, I think there has been a change where local newspapers have changed and that the amount of the volume of coverage and the level of scrutiny is probably less in many cases now, sadly. Um, however, I think that some of our former local colleagues, there was variation, and you probably worked on a very astute and good local paper. Um, certainly the one that I did my traineeship of also was won an award at that time and was very uh, well resourced, um, but not all local papers were like that. And I, I think um, it's a slight, in my view, it's a slightly more mixed picture. Um, I think there are lots of um, interesting developments in uh, newer forms of media as well. I've just been um, working on a campaign to save some um, bus routes in my constituency, and actually that's been led by um, local residents using um, social media um, and, in fact, leaflet um, at a community level, below the level of a local newspaper or even current, um, that we now have our, what was our local evening paper now fully online, that used to be the Reading Evening Post, um, and it's now called Get Reading, um, and when I um, was much younger, I did work experience there, and they had 25 people in the newsroom, it was a small daily, and so on, much smaller team now, but I think even in the old days, they might not have covered that, um, that sort of thing, in the, to the extent that the community would be able to, so my view is slightly more mixed, but I think you are onto something, um, and I think there's maybe a lack of appreciation from some quarters of the, the, the value in local newspapers. Um, certainly so, as, as a newly elected MP, I think they are hugely useful. So are um, local social media um, and other outlets in, in, the, uh, in the area. And I, I deal with local radio lots as well, which is very valuable. Well, one, one thing I did want to say, sorry, I know you've got lots of questions, but <clears throat> the thing that motivated me most to write that article originally was purely selfish, because when I was a local journalist, the most important thing for me was to cease being a local journalist. I wanted to get off that local paper as quickly as I could. And the best way, I mean, in the end, I spent 18 months, perhaps two years there, and I loved it. But I wanted to go and work on the Evening Standard. I wanted to go and have evening shifts on the, on the Nationals. I would work all day and then go, and that's what I did. I worked on the evening shifts. But the key thing was always, if I could get a story on a local newspaper and sell it to the Evening Standard, that was my way in. That was my little toe in the door. And if I could have a story that would run and run, maybe three, four, five pieces, or whatever, and the Evening Standard would come back to me and say, can you get us a, a good local quote? That would have been my ticket out of there. And not to, I'm not denigrating local newspaper, but it was, it was ambition. And so that is why local, a local journalist would have made a great story there, because it was a story <coughs> that would have got into other newspapers. And that is when the story has traction, when it, be, when it gets into the Evening Standard or other Thank you. Well, actually, let's keep on that theme then. So, Laura, um, you wrote a really provocative article which said, and I quote, journalists shouldn't self-flagellate about not having guessed the result of the general election, but that they should about Grenfell. So, what are, what are your views there? So, it's worth remembering, I think, with Grenfell, that it happened on June the 14th. And, of course, we had a general election on June the 8th. And I think by that point, I was just, I was totally and utterly fed up with hearing this idea that somehow journalists had let the entire country down because they hadn't guessed that Jeremy Corbyn would get the result that he's got. Which I found strange because John McDonnell at 2am was still on television saying, I don't think this is going to be the result, please all calm down. <laughs> and I feel like if you've been John McDonnell and you've spent all those weeks out on the doorstep, <laughs> you know, meeting everybody and you still don't believe it, it was a bit surreal to expect journalists to do that. 
But, you see, I think there was a failure here of the national media, and I, I actually I, I disagree a little with Grant on the, on the local element, because I think there's a failure around campaigning that's happening. I think, actually, if you look at the residents' blogging, that was doing the same thing as local journalism would do. The level of literacy, the level of ability to get facts, the level of, of kind of the things that you had to do by pounding the streets 15 years ago, you can do as a citizen now much more easily. That doesn't mean it should replace all journalism, but I think actually the failure there was of people not listening. And so why are people not listening? Why is there a failure of campaigning? And I think there is something around um, who, who is... Who is uh, listening to these issues and actually this wasn't a local issue. Grenfell happens to be the tower that went on fire but this cladding has been used all across the country. It is actually a systematic failure of building regulations. Now inside housing were onto this, they were reporting on it. In fact we had a government who were in the middle of doing a review that was heavily delayed and where I think there's been a serious issue here is why, who were the correspondents on the national press who should have had in their diaries that this building review was now two years out of date. Why weren't they running phone calls? And you know, it's because it's very hard to run a story that says something hasn't happened. We all face that problem, but we have to find ways to do it. And you know, we make that and have made that at Schools Week in the last three and a half years a real policy that we put in diaries when stuff is supposed to happen and we start making noises when it doesn't because there's no point waiting until a building is burnt down, and then you go and report, you know, five people are dead, we should be reporting six months in advance that stuff isn't happening, and pushing on those doors. And that's why I think it was annoying that apparently we were all to, you know, suddenly bow down and say, sorry, working class people, apparently we didn't listen to you, which I think was just a nonsense. But in fact, those same journalists hadn't been listening to what was being said about the building regulations, for example. Um, Sarah, would you mind if I just come in? Because I want to just um, build on something that Laura said, if that's okay. Um, I, I think um, what you said about the trade press is really interesting. Mm. Um, however, there's another aspect that we need to perhaps consider, which is that, certainly in my experience, a lot of the um, trade media, or specialist media, is avidly read by specialist journalists on national newspapers. And perhaps some of the connection hasn't been made there. That a lot of the, there's been a big thinning out in both broadcast and print journalism of specialism yeah. at a national level, or even to read, you know, even the Stevie Sanders or another metropolitan centre where you might have had um, you know, a huge newsroom of 35 people, um, even local, you know, BBC might have had a specialist journalist covering all sorts of aspects that are now are shared. And I think that, that might be part of the problem actually, that, that you guys are doing your work still very well, um, where that specialist media still exists, but it's not being picked up in quite the same way. And so maybe you want to add some of the story to it. Charlie, what are your views as a, as a media professor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, that was exactly the right point to make, which is that this is all connected. Um, that you, in a way, it's a bit strange to talk about local journalism as if it's always distinct from national journalism or international journalism. Because when you consume journalism, you know, I don't think people make that distinction anymore. It's all, it's all mixed up. I mean, I was very lucky that I started as a, I, I worked on a fantastic tabloid local newspaper called the South London Press. But actually, my career started on a really crap free sheet called the Croydon Comet. <laughs> and it was thanks to Murdoch busting the unions and so on that existed. And it was, if you like, it was a pre-digital, pre-internet innovation. Uh, and I think what we're seeing, is, as Matt says, is that there's a, a, a much more complex kind of tapestry of, of, of media. And we're still in very much a period of, of transition. I think there's some real, real gaps you can't take hundreds and hundreds of journalists out of local journalism without it having an effect. But it's very important to think about why that has happened. Uh, it's partly happened because of appalling mismanagement by many of the local media groups. It's also happened, though, because people aren't buying local newspapers. You can't force them to. It's not just because the advertising has gone, the class has gone. They're not buying the newspapers. They're not interested. Now, it's partly because they've got worse, those papers. But that's interesting, so what are people doing and where are they getting information, be it around a campaign, be it around information about school league tables and so on, well they're getting it from lots of other good places, uh, or they're getting it from lots of other places anyway. Uh, some of those are run by government, local authority, or by you know, strategic communications companies and so on. 
or people are finding it you know, through open government, etc. Uh, so I think you have to start from the basis of what does the citizen need, and you realise it's a very complex ecosystem. I think the Grenfell Tower one, you have to be very careful not to draw too many conclusions from that. As you said, the Grenfell Tower problem was not there was an absence of information, it was that people weren't connecting the information in a meaningful way. But I suppose my point is that <coughs> I, I think local journalism is different from other journalism, there are other kinds of journalism. It's closer, it's more meaningful, <coughs> it really is part of the community. And so the initial question was, with, that you gave to me was, could it have been, would it have happened with an effective local newspaper? No, no, no but you have to ask yourself, way, when, I agree happened. with that, but you have to ask yourself who provides the local, what does it mean to be local? So, for example, I remember, you know, South London Press, I'd waddle into a pub in Lewisham expecting people to be examining my superb front page scoop <laughs> on, you know, political corruption and the Labour group in Southwark or something. Uh, strangely enough, they were turning to the latest news on Millwall, yeah. or they were looking at the classified adverts, they needed a fridge. That's what they were doing. Uh, and so I think you have, you know, and those things have been replaced. They're now fantastic. Uh, Millwall or Charlton, I'm not biased, or Palace, I'm a West Ham fan, so I'm neutral, but you know, <laughs> fantastic journalism about football by fans, for fans, or all by experts. So why would you go to your local paper for that? Because it's actually closer to them, better to them, for them, than when I did that journalism. Now, where there's gaps, maybe around, for example, you know, um, uh, it holds, you know do, looking at courts, councils, of course, very important, planning uh, applications and so on. I think there are gaps. I'm certainly not, not, not an optimist in that sense. And I think it's still, we're still in this transition period. Hyperlocals have not taken over. There are wonderful things, you know, including yours, you know, where, which strangely is a form of local journalism because they will dive down and give people information they can use locally. If you think about where you live, obviously London is a bit weird. We're all a bit more... Um, What's the word? Mul we're, we're disorientated geographically. But you know, I live in Bethnal Green. My half my family is in in North London. Um, you know, over half of them is international. I work at the LSE. I have all sorts of different connectivities according to hobbies and interests and so on. If I just bought the East London Advertiser, it would barely give me an understanding of where I live because I actually live in a street. I live in a street as well as a borough. Yeah. That's a great segue into the next question, which is investment in individual media is declining. There are these gaps. So what are the wider implications of this? And obviously, you know, the lack of information and stuff that's relevant to you is one of them. But, you know, what are the other implications and what are the next steps? I'll go for you, Grant. <laughs> what are the next steps to save local journalism? Absolutely, where to look at? I mean, where do we get the investment from and how do we address it? Well, I certainly think that there needs to be, there, there perhaps needs to be new partnerships for them. Uh, I know that in the past the BBC has been spoken about as a potential partner of local newspapers. Um, and I spoke to the editor of the Sheffield Star uh, this afternoon actually because I was quite interested in some of the stuff that they're doing and they've been very campaigning and campaigning seems to be a key thing for them and that's what is boosting sales. But they do things in conjunction with BBC Sheffield and the two of them work together, the two outfits work together. So I think that Partnerships with local media organisations such as BBC is essential. And I also feel, and I don't know how we're going to do this, we can't solve it here in Russell Square, but convincing um, internet companies such as Facebook and Google, especially Facebook, to uh, fund local journalism in some way. Perhaps local journalists. M my feeling is that if there are people if there are journalists working there, forget about the newspaper, but if there are journalists working on the ground, stories will come out, stories will emerge, and communities will feel strongly if there are people there. And I feel that the internet companies should be funding journalism in that way. Matt, do you have a view on that? It's quite interesting um, in terms of pushing people back into communities, holding local yeah. power to account, filling in those gaps, like looking at the councils, etc. Yeah. etc. Et yeah. I mean, I'm, I'd be interested to know more about your thoughts, actually. Um, in our area, there have been a number of experiments over the, the local evening paper going fully online, mm -hmm. um, which does seem to be commercially viable, but with a much reduced team. Um, in London, the evening standards become a, a massive free paper, haven't it, as well? 
Um, I think the idea of the shepherd lobby is interesting, but I'd, I'd like to know more about it. Mm. And I suspect what will actually happen is there'll be a whole mishmash of different tapestry, of different sorts of offers in different parts of the country. And it may also lead to the demographics of the area. The places I live in have a very young population. It's very similar to now to London Borough um, in, in its makeup. Uh, but in other parts of the country, maybe things won't change quite as rapidly. So I also think we're looking at this probably from a London and sort of urban perspective. And it may be in some places that things continue as they were for a very long time. Um, so I've, I've got quite an open mind, really. I think the important thing is that we um, do everything we can to focus on encouraging quality journalism, um, as in, in the broadest sense, you know, in the sense of do something that people want to read. I, I spoke, also spoke to the editor of your local paper, the yeah. day, and yeah. that's something that you like. But, um, and she was saying the same thing, that, that when, it's, when it's campaigning, when they are issue-focused, mm -hmm. um, and talking about the evening standard, the great irony of this evening's conversation is that Actually, we're in the city with one of the great local newspapers that covers hardly any local news whatsoever. And that, to me, is a really serious problem when mm -hmm. the editors of local newspapers don't have any taste for the areas that they cover. You've got a really good point. Charlie, as the founder of the NSE's Media Policy Project, would you say that cultural and editorial columns are compiling the issues caused by education and resources? Um, I mean, to, to the point that Grant's just made? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, I love Grant's point that I was the same, you know, I was, uh, when I was on the SLP, you know, I was um, desperately trying to sell stories to, to Fleet Street, and I did end up getting a job at London Weekend Television. Can you imagine that? There used to be a television station devoted to London for the weekends. <laughs> yeah. Now, that I went for that job as well. That's right. <laughs> but, you got it. but that's the point. And I think Matt makes the point that the, 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 the infrastructure has changed mm. utterly. Um, and, you know, I think you've got to go with the flow of that. You've got to look at, um, I love the idea of more collaboration. We've seen the BBC is doing 150 journalists who are now going to help try and do the public service journalism for uh, local newspapers. And I also think there's a role around um, even politicians and local authorities who spend a lot of money uh, on creating their own you know, magazines and so on. I would love them, not necessarily actually to support their local paper, but to think harder about how they might support um, you know, local information systems. And they can be all sorts of things like, often very specialist, like that may be around schools and education, the kind of mum's net thing around parenting and so on. Um, so I think the infrastructure in the end really matters um, and the loss of news brands really matters because they do provide things like training, legal protection and so on. And somehow you've got to provide more of that kind of, 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 of resource. I'm slightly worried, I can see wonderful opportunities uh, with our lovely friends from Facebook who are incredibly keen that they become a community platform that you do Facebook pages, we're doing Facebook Live. Yeah. There are fantastic opportunities around that. Um, all I'd say is just be slightly careful about what you wish for um, because you become overly dependent. And know, for example, I think it's the Cumbrian News, which effectively became a Facebook only uh, platform and um, is now struggling every time they change their algorithm, if they change their you know, revenue models suddenly they're, they're hung out to dry. But unfortunately, you know, this is not unique to, to local journalism. What's your experience, Laura? What's, what's your feeling that? I suppose if I start from the perspective of, of readers in all of this, and as someone mm. who, I guess, grew up sort of through the internet, early internet age, and, and in, so my, my beginnings of media, actually I worked weirdly as a youth journalist on Teletext, which was right. great, and I used, oh, I used oh, to be a teacher <laughs> and try and explain Teletext to someone who never saw Teletext, and it's very sort of like the internet on your telly with only 900 pages. But, um, <laughs> but, but when you think about that, then it's actually slightly difficult to come up with the concept again with the local stuff and the campaigning for example we've got 38 degrees who are an online very strong campaigning platform who do very good local campaigns so if we're saying that journalism is there in the local you know arena to be a campaign arm why don't we just let 38 degrees do it um, and that's where this starts to become tricky and the question i come back to is are people less informed now 
that there isn't local journalism. And I'm not sure that they are. Because I, I do think that actually a lot of social media informs people, maybe not in the way that I want them to, but they are probably better informed than they were before. The bit that's tricky is we don't have the vegetables anymore. So essentially, if you think of a meal, you've kind of got the, the meat and the gravy, and then you've got the vegetables, which is the bit you kind of want to just throw in so no one notices, because that's the bit that's good for you. And that's the problem with the loss of the local newspapers. You could have your mill wall in there, which was the nice bit that you wanted, but you also got the court reporting by default. And now that we've fragmented it all up, I'm not sure where we're going to shove the vegetables in. And that's the slightly complicated And also the important, the important thing about that is that it's, it does connect within a newsroom. So, for example, take Millwall. You know, Lewisham had just had this, this big controversy around you know, property development around Millwall. Mm -hmm. you know, now, in a newsroom, they would connect you know, the sports reporter and the, the council reporter. There would be a kind of connection. Were not good enough, and that's the point of the Grenfell story, which you explained beautifully. There was information, there was a blog, there was the specialist magazine. It's just that people didn't join up the dots. Now, I don't know if that's a local paper that has to do that, a national paper, or an MP, frankly, um, who should be doing that. But that, that, that's the, the problem. The connection. Just to go back to what you said just before, Laura, how do you think people, you say people are better informed? Yeah. About what? About most things to do with their local community. They're much better informed. I think you take something like My Street, you take things like yeah. between between blogs, Twitter, My Street, Facebook, They're um, more still blogs. still chatting at the school gates. Blogs, so people are more educated blogs, than they Twitter, were twenty years ago. My Street, all these different you know digital platforms. What if I don't use digital? What if I? I mean, we you are, probably we, weren't reading local we papers. Are, that's completely wrong. We are. We're in this little bubble here. We live in this little bubble in London, in which we assume. That everyone no, it's a very consumes. Big bubble. Okay, so it's very. And even out. This little bubble here. Even out in the north. We, we yeah. assume that. Even out in the north. We assume that. We assume that. We do. And I don't think that they, I don't think that they do. And that is why I worry when we sort of say people are as well informed as they ever were. I don't think they are. No, no, no. They're, they're, they're more informed. They may not be better. Better informed. But they've definitely got more information. Um, it, uh, the potential to access more information. Can I come yeah. back on that? Because yeah. uh, my parents are both councillors in Widnes, which is a unitary authority just on the outskirts of, 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 of Liverpool. So I'm not, I am one of those even northerners who has uh, in the internet. Well done, you. And, um, and, and they're both, both councillors. I would say my parents are far more afraid of my, I think it's my street. I don't use it down here in London. I use Twitter in my bubble. In their Widnes bubble, my street is huge. They're terrified. My mum is terrified if someone likes face, something about Facebook or about her. She's not bothered if she put it on front of the Witness World because no one's reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Witness World. Um, but they are bothered if you put it on my street or on Facebook because their friends will see it. And then the next thing you know, when she's in the co op down the street, someone's going to come off and say, Did you see that thing that's on Facebook? So I, I do think that actually different communities use this differently, mm. but, but we can't say that because papers aren't there that, that people aren't informed. I'm going to come back. I think we're going to get to your questions. Just coming up. I think Laura's making a great point, but I wanted to just add something to it as well. Um, in the example of the bus issue that Charles is talking about, uh, absolutely fascinating because what you said held true to up to a point, but there are a group of quite elderly people who we found were completely excluded yeah. from that, who don't have the internet at home, they don't have a mm -hmm. smartphone, they don't even have a mobile phone. And we were surprised at the extent of that isolation still exists. Yeah. So when we when the um, Ready Buses um, proposed shutting part of one bus route just to hold another one, there were people living right next to those bus routes who didn't realise that for several days afterwards. Mm. There were another group of people who were all on Facebook all the time and knew within minutes. And the bus company only put something out on social media. And actually, that, that, that's a really interesting example of how this can, the sort of limitations almost still. And you probably find as an MP as well that there's a, another corollary problem, yeah. which is proportionality. That if you get some super active person on Twitter who's constantly yeah. bombarding you with stuff, yeah. now why should he or she get more attention from you than somebody else? And 38 degrees is an example of this. You know, they're pro forma, yeah. you know. I mean, that's, that's worth picking up on actually, because it's something I have noticed. And I have been a councillor for six years before, and the step up in terms of casework is dramatic. But one interesting part of it is the way that people will um, approach it on social media, mm -hmm. and they'll use social media in the same way that. Um, 
and some of this is lobbying organisations doing this very effectively. Mm -hmm. In the same way, the Friends of the Earth or somebody might send you a postcard for Parliament saying, "Will you sign my fees um, amendment, whatever it is?" You get that on social media in real time, um, and so there are certain people with access to these platforms who are, who are very good at it. There might be other people from other age groups who aren't able to access that, and there is a, a big difference between the two groups. And that makes it again my point about what is local. Yeah. If you've got somebody locally, <coughs> I, I who lives there geographically in your constituency, arguing with you about a bus yeah. route. But if it's 38 degrees, they've suddenly said we ought to do a national campaign mm -hmm. on bus subsidies. You know, how do you differentiate mm -hmm. it? It's complicated, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we're going to get quite a few questions on that right now when we open up to the room. So I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, I want to talk about, you know, the cost of news today. And um, we talked about partnerships a little bit, we only just touched upon it. But um, I wanted to ask, have Google and Facebook actually killed the traditional advertising revenue model? Uh, are they really going to solve it by putting money in? Is that, is that the way forward? Grant, I'm going to come to you first. Thank you, because I suggested it. I think putting money in, <laughs> funding real people. Yeah. That's my feeling. I, I, look, that's just sort of, it's not going to talk my head. They, as they, they rely on local communities flourishing in some way, Facebook and Google. Everything relies on a, on a flourishing local community. And if you have a flourishing local media, a local newspaper with journalists on the ground, I believe that that helps. And so funding people, I think, is a key thing. Mm -hmm. Matt, what's your view? Should some of the writers taking the BBC be used in that way? You know, extend, extend their role somehow? Um, I'd need to look into it in more detail, really. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure quite what the mechanics of that might be. I mean, also, there's an issue about both BBC and newspaper independence as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure that's necessarily the answer, but I think it's worth some further debate, really. Um, I mean, I, I'm a little bit more wary about organisations like Facebook, which are commercial, paying for journalism, and that, that to me, sounds a little bit like a, an advertising partner. Yeah. Um, well, they're not paying for journalism, they are, they are funding yeah, yeah, but there's a, there's, there could be a possible conflict of interest. Yeah, they're not sure, but I mean, that's possible. Equally, I mean, you know, we need people all different ways. I'm, I'm thinking of universities. They are typically in uh, in areas where there are where there once were a great deal of mm. local newspapers. Mm. Maybe there's a way that you know vice chancellors could cut their six hundred and fifty thousand pounds salary yeah. yeah. and fund some <laughs> journalists instead. Controversial way forward. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to move on, um, just a little bit quiz more quickly, just because I'm very aware that there are questions from the room that we need to take and, and time's moving on. So one of the things I do want to talk about is trust in the media. Now we've talked about how without local papers people are filling the gaps elsewhere and turning to uh, other blogs and perhaps a government departments to help them get the information they need. But um, the Edelman Trust Barometer this year showed that at the start of 2017, just 24% um, of people had trust in the media. So it's at an all-time low. Um, it seems that cynicism towards media agendas has, has really hardened. Uh, and the narratives that we're seeing is, are, are being challenged. And we certainly saw that after Grenfell. And there was a, a video <coughs> of uh, one of the community challenging the Sky crew straight afterwards, as, as people saw that. What does this mean? How do we address that issue? You know, if, if people are really struggling to trust the media, where do we go from here? It's quite a, a significant problem. Compounds the issue. Charlie, I'm going to come to you first. Yeah, well, obviously I think it's a problem because, of, um, as you mentioned, we're at the LSE we're just launching a Truth, Trust and Technology Commission, which is going to look at the whole you know, informational crisis. And we think the trust thing is, is very important. But I also think it's a dreadful word. Mm -hmm. Because it's 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 always misunderstood, you know. The, the figures are that people, you know, if you read, Fo if you watch Fox News, <coughs> that's the channel you will trust above all. Um, if you read the Guardian, you will trust the Guardian. So I'm not quite sure exactly what it means. Um, and also, do you really want people to trust journalists, for example, in a way that I think it's healthy that they have a scepticism because that in a sense gives journalists scepticism if you're supposed to love journalists and journalists are supposed to love you then it makes it very hard for journalists to say difficult things you know things that you might not want to hear for example so 
I don't actually want a point where everyone trusts journalists. Where you worry about it is when they don't trust journalism and when they don't trust you know, evidence-based reporting or where they don't allow for other people to express their views. That, I think, is, is much more, more worrying. Um, you know, and there are good reasons, you, you, you know the stories, why people shouldn't trust journalists. So, um, I, I, I think in a way, I mean, I respect what Edelman are doing with their trust barometers, but I think it's a bit of a distraction, but it's a good conversation starter. You know, what would make you trust a journalistic source more? And is it things like um, fact-checking, well up to a point, um, is it things like transparency, you know, thinking about what would make you appreciate or value or feel that journalism is relevant, I think are the key answers. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, a, a marriage or a relationship, you know, that you understand each side's got faults and so on, but it's, it, it's a continuous thing about what can you do for me, how relevant are you, how useful are you, um, will you say difficult things that I need to hear and so on. So I think that's how you, you should me measure trust, rather than the idea that you should trust me in the way that you should somehow trust your priest. You know, journalists are not priests, and they're not scientists either, for example. You know, I think you should try and uh, you know, trust scientists with evidence and so on. But I, I don't think it should be a, 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 you know, a deferential Obviously, one of the things that creates this trust is fake news, which you know has always been around, but is definitely you know a big thing at the moment yeah. with all the different elections. Are there politicians who keep you awake at night? Do you worry about how you can communicate with your constituents and without it being distorted? Um, so far, I'm not, not I'm not particularly worried about it in my own case, but you never know. Um, I think there is an issue with fake news, um, and I also think the Edelman thing. I haven't seen the latest one. Tends to kind of imply that people trust the media that they like, or possibly that they trust media that has some connection with them. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure what that's saying. Whether that means that um, we're all living more isolated lives, talking to people like us, which is one possibility, or is it familiarity with that particular media? I, I'm not sure. But um, there's kind of a healthy side to it and a, a slightly concerning side as well. I think. Um, I certainly hope that. Local sources of news, more than one maybe, um, which are respected in their communities. Thank you. Well, one last question as well for the whole panel um, before we open out to the room. How, I'm just thinking, obviously, we're sat in the Chartered Institute of Public Relations today, lots of comms people watching. What's the role of the public relations practitioners today as this shift takes place within media? How can we support local media better? What, what should our role be? Is there an answer there? Computer, solar. It's not an easy one. We're wrestling with this. Help us out. It's not. And I, I, I also do want to just say something really important on this trust thing. I know you don't want to go backwards, but I will okay. link it in. Um, just because I think I said earlier, I grew up um, in the 80s, just outside of Liverpool. Uh, and I really understand what an all-time low of trust in the media is, because, of course, I was around at the time of Hillsborough. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I grew up being told the only job I couldn't do was be a journalist. By my family, I mean, it's, it's it's synonymous with killing pigeons. Where we're around, so I'm like, this is not this is not a job that's okay to do. Um, but I think it, but I think it tells us something that I think that actually what happened at Hillsborough is really important, which was that mistakes were made and it took 25 years for them to be uncovered and they had to be dragged out of people. And you know, where I was growing up, people didn't understand what it was to be a journalist, what what the media were ever dealing with. And one of the things I did when I started with School Week was wrote a piece that said this and committed to us being very honest and having open dialogues with a lot of our readers and doing a lot more to explain the journalism that we were doing and why we decided to take the angles that we decided to take, inform teachers much better about how things worked. And that has developed a huge amount of trust from a community. School teachers do not particularly love the media, um, has developed a lot of that trust. Now I think maybe as public relations practitioners going forward, you've got to think about what are you trying to achieve? I think we're very, very, as an industry, I think journalism is very focused still on stories. What we do is we produce stories for people, whereas in fact it's about information. Are people getting the information of various types? How can you help them get that? If you're a public relations practitioner, don't think about placing stories. Don't think about sort of the old forms of numbers. Think about influence. 
think about how do you get to people and they will trust you know openness and honesty and they will trust different routes to them um, if they make sense a lot of the time it doesn't make sense to listen to a newspaper if it's very remote from the issue that you're used to thinking about the people writing the story don't understand what they're writing about and you've got no way of complaining about it or having a discussion so it might be that different forms of journalism come about in telling the stories but actually as a PR I might even just think completely differently about completely different routes altogether than stories I think we've got to get away from story mindset right at five plan. I think that's um, for too long, well forever, the worlds of PR and journalism have been very combative, mm. one against the other. Mm. And they have, I think now we are in such a dire state with media and funding and closures and job losses and all those sorts of things that we need to be working together much more closely. And that's why journalists need to think like PRs, PRs need to think like journalists, we should be embedding each other in own different uh, work environments and if we are focusing again on local news and local newspapers I think there is an enormous benefit that um, public relations professionals can bring to to storytelling within local newspapers and I so I basically my feeling is that the, the divisions have got to disappear Okay, we're going to go open up to the room now. Um, if you do have a question, please put your hand up. And when I come to you, and you can please introduce who you are and direct your question at whoever you'd like to speak to, or I'll, I'll direct it at the panel. So, any questions? There's got to be quite a few. Maybe it's that way. You mean if there if there was if PRs and, ju and journalists were working together, um, would Grenfell have happened be because of that? Um, you know what? I, I don't know whether I don't know whether in that specific issue whether having PR involvement would necessarily have um, made the journalist's job easier. I mean, my initial standpoint is that is that a, a good journalist seen that story for a long, long time before it happened, probably 18 months before anything came close to the, to the fire. And so the involvement of PRs, not necessarily in that kind of story, but I was, one example, if, if you don't mind, I, I, was, I was talking to the... This is I, the Reading Wrong. I, I, I forgot really, to, to mention them, I mentioned them. No, that's right. Opposition. I, only I wasn't to ask, obviously I was digging in to find out about you, but unfortunately you said you are a very nice person. <laughs> but we were talking about stories, and we were talking about this, and, and she was saying that um, a PR had sent her, I've forgotten, sorry, the editor of the Reading, I've forgotten her name, but she said the PR had sent her a press release talking about Christmas dinners, or Christmas, uh, some local chain of restaurants, and it went in the bin, and then she pulled it out again, she said, actually, you know what, why don't we do win a Christmas dinner at this kind of, at this establishment, or this chain of establishment? If the PR had been thinking like a journalist, had been thinking, this is the sorts of, these are the discussions that they're having in the newsroom. So let me send, let me think about a different kind of story to tell. That's really what I'm talking about in this kind of, in this mix. I mean, I now have to think like a PR, journalism, journalist, businessman, all sorts of different ways in the job that I currently do. And I'm, mu I'm a much better journalist for it, or much better writer for it. Any other questions? Okay. So, Amanda, um, I'm seeking PR help. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in the country this weekend and I got the Gazette and Herald from the Vine Bit. My question is does this panel, this marvellous panel discussion, really think that people want to read about stuff before it happens? There's a fantastic line I'm using tomorrow if it bleeds, it leaks. Um, <laughs> the front page story here is stop waiting parking tax councillors told. What I also do is I'm a reporter presenter on a local radio programme and you did talk about the lack of investment in local media damaging society. The radio programme I work for is continually holding our council to account and the government. And there hasn't been very much discussion about radio so I'd like <laughs> some comments on all that. Sure, Charlie. 
So what was the question? The question is... Local radio. Yeah, local radio is great. Number one, local radio. Local radio is great. Number two is, local papers, are they really able to do something like Grenfell might happen? No, not necessarily. I think so. I think as we've seen, it's, it's, it's much more connected. It's interconnected. Well, it always was. You know, that... You know, I might do a little story on the South London press about people grumbling in a flat that it was too damp or dangerous, and perhaps it would filter up other people. You know, in a housing magazine, might connect the dots elsewhere. It, you know, in fact, the SLP was brilliant. It would have done an investigation. I don't think Grenfell would have happened, but um, and I agree with you that the radio is very important. Uh, and then when you say radio, I say audio, because there's an amazing amount of people doing podcasts, for example, and doing Facebook Lives and so on, you know, uh, are either citizens or The point I would then connect it to is the PR bit, because a lot of content now, do you know there were more people last year in the social survey who said they were journalists? They, what, what job do you do? Self-declaring as journalists, more than ever before. And that's because they're all working in PR and local government and so on, but they still think of them, they've been trained as journalists or they think of themselves as journalists. Now, my point would be, slightly disagreeing, um, I think that it is healthy to have a, a difference. I think that public relations people are there to advocate and promote a cause, and journalists are not. So I don't mind there being friction. At the same time, I do agree there ought to be more mutual understanding, and there's no harm if they can support, in a sense, each other. That's always been the case. One, the metaphor I would leave you with in this sense is this, that try and think about the information system less as a series of, I don't know, newspapers, radio stations, blogs, public relations companies. Think of it more like an environment, like the air you breathe, all right? So there's the environment, the media environment. It's like the atmosphere. Now, are you gonna pollute it or are you gonna keep it healthy? We're all breathing in and out. You know, we're all contributing to to, to the sort of the, the sanity, of, the sanitation of that. And so, public relations people who are now, and be they university people or you know commercial, are all now contributing to this informational atmosphere. And you've got to decide whether you're going to pollute that or not. And that could be ethical, reliable, not do fake news and so on. So, I think that's a better way to think about it, rather than to think specifically, I don't know, should Facebook support local papers? Answer no, by the way. Um, you know, or should public relations people be working hand in hand with journalists? Brackets, no, by the way. But it's more, how do you fit into that overall, uh, whatever you want to call it, ecosystem? Great. Um, Robert, you were nodding away there. What's Two things. I think you're right on the podcast. It's a great point. And I do think that the overlap of, of radio and podcast is interesting, particularly on episodes. So I think there yeah. are some great podcasts that have shown that storytelling, almost episodic, 20 minutes, how you produce, um, the use of one narrator telling a story cut in. It's much more effective than people having conversations, actually, for really getting an issue <coughs> across. Um, I think this thing about not yet having happened, I think you have to be super clever about it, but I think you absolutely can do it. And the best example, I was out in the University of Missouri in the Investive Journalism Unit there, and there was a discussion with a student who wanted to do a project on um, the fact that at that time, Missouri has the death penalty, but the lethal injection, they were getting the injections via an underground system from vets, because it was very difficult to get any pharmaceutical company to provide the injections for prisoners because they would then get picketed and, and lobbied and, and everything else. She wanted to do something on this. I was very much in favour of it and we were stopped by the editor because he said, no one cares about prisoners and this isn't happening yet, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I said, I'm sure we can get a data set that shows, I reckoned, um, if we look at how long it's taking to kill people with these drugs, we're going to find a pattern that it's, it's taking longer. He's like, again, no one's going to care about this. And I was like, but they will. It'll be the cost and the difficulty. Six weeks later, when we didn't bother to get the data set, was when, of course, I think it was in Oklahoma, there was the guy that didn't die. It became huge national news. And I got to send him an email going, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> I 
But it comes back to the point that, you know, the job of journalism is to take not cool and not sexy issues and make them interesting. And you can always find a way. You know, Grenfell, we had had fires in the past. And if you start looking into the fire data, there are some very interesting things where fires were starting across the country in little pockets of data to get out of hand. Again, it's about finding those, building up the picture, and then saying, why are we not doing anything? You know, why should somebody be bothered about the fact that this delay is on? And that's the job. Can't complain about the fact it's difficult, it's just the job. So, I, that's really interesting what you said, because what I was going to say about your question was that your, your question was, can, how can you get, do people really want to know about things before they happen? I sometimes wonder whether journalists <laughs> want to write about things before they've happened. They're very keen on writing about disasters or you know, whatever it's going to be, but do they want to do, as you, as you want to do, write about something before it happens? I, I'm not criticizing journalists, I wouldn't do that, but I wonder whether they have the, Tenacity to do so. Can I I think that the range of views is quite interesting, isn't it? I, mean, I, I can imagine um, in a, a, us as young reporters on a traditional weekly paper campaigning for improvements in Grenfell Block, but it being actually a range of things fire safety, yeah. the quality of the flats, the probably issues like vandalism, a whole range of things. I can really imagine actually if you were the they were quite nice flats, weren't they? Sorry? They were actually quite nice flats. Yeah. Strange yeah. enough, they were not going to talk about it. I probably got less. I can imagine a range of issues being picked up. Um, and I can also imagine lots of um, scare stories being picked up in the media. I think that the challenge of Grenfell is having a fire on that scale. I think that's the, the particular mix of it. Um, so that I think, in a sense, we're all expressing interesting points here on this issue. Um, your other point about the radio, um, I'm a bit of a fan of. Insight into issues, um, and it does allow you to do things as as they're happening a little bit more than print does, and it's more, I think, more natural in, in the way that it does it than um, yeah. some uh, other social media. But when you try and anticipate something, so today I've been on in our our local BBC Radio Berkshire around um, a, a, a council meeting next week where a school which was threatened with closure might get a reprieve. So that type of thing, it's a very natural way of discussing. Next week, are they going to get this? So I'm a bit of a fan of local radio, but I think there's still differences between these different types of media. And in some ways, I think it's quite interesting that the social media types seem to be a little bit more like print than anything else mm -hmm. still. Although it's migrating across, you were saying about the use of podcasts, and it's becoming more like broadcast, and, and maybe that will continue. I don't know, you know more about the direction of travel than me. Yeah. Great, well, I'm going to take one last question before we wrap up. Can you um, cite an example of what good might look like? So I started out on Lancashire Evening Post and Lancashire Evening News, same as many of the stories here today. They're both shadows of what they were. We can blame Facebook or Google and we can moan bits about you know, drinks in the room. <coughs> but um, yeah, what does good actually look like? Well, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on local papers, but for example, I've been really impressed by some of the reporting from the Lancashire Evening News recently um, on a number of things. Obviously, the amazing stuff they did after you know, what the, the, the terror incident. But also they did amazing reporting recently on um, spice, you know, the drug problem. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting the way they've done it. It was a young female reporter who did it in a much more, much less cliched way than I would have done it, for example, <coughs> 30 years ago on the South London Press. She did it in a much more free-flowing, people-centred uh, way. And then she did loads of great social media around it. So I don't think um, it's about, because I, I go back to my first point, which is I do think there is a resource problem. I don't think there isn't a problem in local news. Um, <clears throat> but any kind of solution isn't about a template. You know, I've looked at lots of hyperlocals, and I can find lots of little hyperlocals, but they don't add up to a layer of information that place it. And in a way, I think we've got to get out of this idea that there's going to be a brand that sorts out a geographical space. Because think about how you, I know if you're Londoners, you're a bit more confused about where you live. 
that even if you're not in London, you know, people in Witness, etc., don't just live in Witness. You know, they, they are football fans or anglers or whatever, uh, and they'll have different ways of being catered for. That is the thing we've really got to get. And it's a real problem for the politicians, and this is the people we'll be talking to in terms of how, or not just politicians, but any media strategist, how do you create an infrastructure? How do you foster that? What should politicians do to encourage good local information? It's complicated, and but you know what? That's quite wonderful as well. You know, where I used to live in Kentish Town, we had an email chain which was incredibly valuable. It was just a bunch of people doing it for three street. Incredible valuable resource. And at the same time, we had layer upon layer of other kinds of media, international, global, and local, and personal, and Facebook, and blah. And it was complicated, but it's very rich, and there can be gaps in that. But where there are gaps, there are wonderful opportunities. Bristol. <laughs> Bristol is a really interesting, well, I think it's a really interesting, it started off by talking about the Bristol Pound. So yeah. the Bristol Pound was a, obviously, an invented uh, Bitcoin style currency, which could be used for, only for local shops. And it was pioneered by the local paper down there. And so what happened, what has happened, and this has been going on for about four years now, is that the local shops have thrived because of the Bristol Pound, so that people are spending their money in the local delis and the hardware shops and the dry cleaners, whatever it's going to be. And it's all because the Bristol Evening Post, I think it's called down there, mm -hmm. um, uh, along with PR representatives from um, the high street and from um, uh, independent retailers, they worked out, they said, listen, we need to do something about this, and they have. And so uh, I think that, I think that's just an interesting, I don't know enough about it. All I know is I've been reading about the Bristol Pound, I think it's a really interesting thing that they've done. Laura, any final comments? Um, observations that you want to make? Well, I suppose it's just, it's not local, but I know it's in our paper, I think of us as local, as you say, in some senses, we, we have a particular industry. And in the last year, I think we did two things. One was the story around the children who were, schools were being asked to collect data on people's nationalities. And actually those were local stories, largely from Hackney, working in collaboration with a number of Hackney journalists who were, able, who were able to link us to children who could ask for their passports and actually particular communities that was really stopping people wanting to send their children to those schools by having it on the front of our paper, then linking to the national media, then putting pressure on the Department for Education, then a ton of freedom of information requests and hammering away at it, we got a fundamental agreement written which said that data would not be handed to the Home Office and now there are children in school this year who I know wouldn't have been in school this year because of the work that my reporter Freddie did. Now I think that is an example of good and there's no reason why that couldn't have been done by the Evening Standard or a regional paper or anybody else. It wasn't rocket science, it's basic classic journalism. We learnt that because our reporters are from local papers and they brought all of those skills with them. So I think that's, a, that's an example of good. Thanks, Laura. And Matt, any final comments from you before? Yeah, I, I think what Bill and Alan Mendes have said quite clearly, good is still out there, um, but we're in a very changing environment, aren't we? And so um, I suppose it's all down to us as people who need to use the media and work in it to help foster that good by being um, a good partner and friend or work associate and helping the media do its job well as far as we can. I don't think there's any one pattern of what that might be, and, and I think your point about recruiting traditional talents is a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm going to draw the event to a close. If, um, we've reached our time. I think you all agree it's been absolutely fascinating, fascinating debate. I could have kept asking questions all night, and I've had to keep my mouth shut. It's been incredibly difficult. <laughs> um, but I would like you to put your hands together and say thank you to the panel. <laughs>